nice to be here. I don't think that my discussion will be anything like earlier session. It wouldn't be anything to do with the geopolitical tensions. But tech is becoming a very critical part of how we live, and technology can make a big difference in our society. So I'm really happy the founder of Yahoo, investor Alibaba Jerry Yang, and myself are here together to talk about how tech can contribute for the better world. So let me just give you a couple of perspectives first, and then we can have uh, discussions. So we all know where we are in terms of tech contribution, right? You know, the first wave, you could say that personal computer really helped us to have computers all your desktops, all the way to the internet era where information is helping us to be more productive, connected, and then mobile era where we are sleeping with phones every day. Maybe it's not a good thing, but it is. And there are over 8 billion phones that are being sold around the world. Now today, really we're in a fourth wave. All those technology coming together, it's an, about atoms and bits. Bits because it's a digital technology. Atoms is because physical. It's the products that are coming together, of convergence that can be able to make an impact going forward. So I, will, I want to kind of go back. How did tech contribute for a better world? Typically, today, tech has not been the best word to describe goodness. But actually, if you think about the way we live today, you would not be able to live without the benefit of technology. Just look at the personal computer alone. If you look at that, your compute power is a thousand times faster. Your memory is a million times more capacity. And just every segment alone is a cheaper, better, and getting, getting the information faster through the network. And if you look at even mobile era, which I think all of you have, on the left, 1980, there was a movie called Wall Street. This guy named Goldie Gecko, I don't know if you remember that person, he had this really expensive phone because he was in private equity, where the money was. And his phone was really expensive, his talk time was maybe 30 minutes, he couldn't send you a text message, he couldn't do video chat, but he had a phone. And today, you can get the latest state-of-art Note 10 that can get you the kind of performance with the talk time and the performance that are just make you and seamless in your living. So we have made a tremendous changes in improving technologies to impact our lives uh, everywhere from the, not only this country in Korea, all the way to Africa, Asia, and other countries. So where is it going from where we are today? First of all, it is not true that we all have internet. Only 50 some percent of people have internet. So we do have inclusive and inclusion issues in the sense that not everybody has an access to internet. And I think it's really important, given today this is really critical too, Access is a right. Access is an opportunity for people to participate in a better world. So it's an issue that we have to deal with. I think the other issue that we have to deal with is that uh, area of the cyber attacks. As we are downloading more and more information, it's not just the uh, companies, not just consumers, but the countries are being attacked. In fact, my own personal credit card got hacked through the um, the bank that are dealing with in the US, 100 billion, million people got compromised. So what do I have to do? I have to freeze my credit so that nobody can create new identification based on my information. So we are in a very defensive mode. I think that's true for not only individually, corporations are in defensive mode, and the country is being attacked by other countries. And this is going to be the new warfare that we are going to live with. So we are in a very different stage of um, world that, uh, that are started in an innocent way, connected in a better way, but now the technology is being used for in a very negative sense. So I do believe, though, the different technologies that evolved from semiconductor all the way to sensors and connected the world we're living in, together we can be able to impact not only using technology, but technology that can impact our lives, health, Autonomous driving, insurance, education, 
all those things are going to be impacted better by combining technologies. So my talk really today is that tech can be good or bad. It's all depend on how it's used. And we need to figure out how to use technology for better. And one example of technology that I think getting a lot of attention is mobility as a service. Often people talk about autonomous driving. I think mobility as a service is bigger than just autonomous driving. It really is about technologies that can make our, li our lives better. Could it be a autonomous driving? It could be robots. It could be assisted technologies that can make our productivity. So I think there's a lot of technologies that are coming that can make us live better as we're aging going forward and disabled people aging citizens can be able to get benefit of technologies going forward. And as you can see, the kind of technology we're developing for drones, autonomous cars, robotics, these are all going to be really critical in enabling tools that can advance our, our society. So the question is then, how do you go from where we are to the mobility service as an example, as, as a journey? And I think we can learn some lessons from mobile phones. If you think about mobile phones, when you have a phone from Korea, you could not use that in Europe. When you had a phone in GSM phone, you couldn't use that in the United States. All those things had gotten better because of the interoperability, agreeing on certain radio, agreeing on certain architecture, so that we become much efficient and producing a tool that all of us can spread. So the industry have to collaborate. I think earlier there was a big discussion between US and China. Tension, geofencing, different standard will slow us down. Actually, in my view, as technology companies, we really like to see a convergence and collaborative tools that can create one standard so that we can be able to advance much quicker than the way, the way where we're going. So, we are in a very interesting time where geo, geotension will slow and impact technology progress. So if you look at the, um, what I think as a feature, Mobility 2.0, it's about, let's say, autonomous driving. To do that, there are many things we have to do. For instance, 5G. 5G that we deploy in the US. 5G that we deploy in Europe. 5G we deploy in China. If they're not operatable, it will be redundant investment, and it will create all kinds of interoperability issues. But that's not the only one. Government can set the rules about safety. What is these rules of safety that are acceptable for machine? Is it 10 times better than human driving? Is it 1,000 times better than human driving? These are the kind of debates and discussion that we must have because it's a machine era now, not just humans. Today, when you're driving a car, you're responsible. But tomorrow, when a car is driving by itself, who is responsible? And therefore, the standard will change. It will be much higher degree of expectation. To achieve that, you also need much better infrastructure so that you can be able to understand where you are relative to your device and your people. So these are some of the things we have to work together as an organization, as a companies, as a government, and industrial and international collaborations. If it does not happen, tech is not going to make progress. So this is an example of major example of opportunity where we can work together to make progress that can may have, have a positive impact. So in many eyes, many ways, the data that I or data with AI is what matters. I think that's how you get the insight. All of the industry that you are in, I don't know what industry you are in, whether it's finance, security, insurance, hospitals, management, all of the industry will be impacted by it. And I know already when I look at number of new ideas, you know, there are many proposals to eliminate and change the way we do things in insurance industry. There is a proposal to change the way we do things in agriculture using the drones, using the sensors, and being able to change medical care so that instead of reactive care, 
when, when you are sick, you see a doctor, all the way to be able to see what's coming based on your data, being able to predict what could be coming, and therefore it's more proactive way of managing health, which should be a cheaper and more preventive way of doing it. Just like, think about your automobiles. When you're driving a car, do you try to check your oil anymore? Do you try to check your air anymore? It's all done in sensors, right? And you know what's going on in your cars because you proactively monitoring with the sensors about vital information. That could happen to you. Your body could have an information about glucose, blood pressure, all certain vital markers that can come with your genome information, your phenome information, your lifestyle information, and the wearables in your phone can give you a lot of those insights around your body that can give you much better insight about what's going on. So I believe the great ideas are coming from everywhere today, not just in Silicon Valley. Because the world is flat, information is out there, education is great, every country wants to create digital economy. So in my view, the opportunity is not Korea, it's not Silicon Valley, it's not Berlin, it's not London. You have to go after everywhere as a global opportunity. And you can see major, major successful companies are coming everywhere around the world. Today, this afternoon, we have a session on going global with Korean startups to encourage to think about you have to go bigger market and together we can make a bigger impact around those. So to make that impact, we have announced some of the programs to really support global sustainability, as well as creating a competition to support UN 17 sustainability goals. It's called Extreme Tech Challenge. The idea is really have startups start thinking about something that can make a bigger impact that are more around better water, better nutrition, better health, or better inclusiveness. These are some of the things that can really change the world around the world. And a good idea could come from Kenya, it could come from Korea, it could come from Indonesia. So we are calling a, a, a what I call competition to announce the world to come in. And there will be more discussion around this tomorrow with the ex uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So we'll talk more about this subject uh, tomorrow around this subject. But meanwhile, Jerry is waiting. CEO of Yahoo, founder of Yahoo, friend of mine, so come on out. Jerry, Thank you. good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you. So Jerry, you are one of the pioneers of the internet. It makes me sound old. I know, you're not that old. Yeah, well. But you are. In internet age, I'm, I'm a dinosaur, right. yes. So, uh, you know, I'm just curious, a lot of people are wondering about Yahoo. Yes. So tell us about how you start Yahoo. Well, I, I think um, for many of you, the web was the first instance of the internet. Uh, but the web really, as we knew it, uh, was started in late 80s, 1989 in fact, so we're coming up on 30 years of the web, uh, when Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, came up with a protocol for World Wide mm -hmm. Web. And so shortly after that uh, came the browser, came the servers, and in early 1993 or 4, um, the world was exploding with uh, content. So you just had to come up with a website and you were able to publish it once, and anybody with a browser and an internet address uh, can view it um, around the world. And so we had an unprecedented, decentralized content publishing community in the early 90s mm -hmm. that uh, was open, that was relatively inexpensive. And just to give you an example, when David Philo and I started Yahoo as a hobby at Stanford University, we were one of the largest websites in the world because we collected other people's websites. And we organized them, we made it searchable. And by the end of 1993, early 1994, the web was still just the beginning but we had over 100 countries, different IP addresses accessing um, our servers. So this was an, you know, not quite instantaneous, but mm -hmm. it was very, very quickly a global phenomenon. 
and it was because of this decentralized and open nature that made Yahoo take off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about today, right, now we have, uh, really Yahoo maybe in my view was one of the first real platform yes. that aggregating much of the services. Today, you know, we are dealing with, uh, you know, I, I would say four platforms, uh, Amazons and Googles and Facebooks, maybe depend on whose definition it changes. But what, what do you see today's platform uh, that has evolved to? And w w what do you think about their power versus what you were trying to do back yes. then? Well, I, I think um, internet companies were in the early phases, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, even as late as Facebook, which was started in 2005, we were disruptors. We were trying to um, disintermediate, disintermediate traditional industries in many different ways. And that was uh, the, the goal, that was the mission to really provide, in our case, information at a very low cost and to, to, to a huge number of people. Uh, in Amazon's case, they were to provide e-commerce um, and, uh, and so on. And so there was this idea of being the, being the challenger. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that is no longer the case for the big platform companies, as you call them. They, they are now the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I think the responsibility change from being a challenger to an incumbent, uh, that is the journey that many of these platform companies are facing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, in the US, as many of you well know, there is uh, quite a big backlash on big tech uh, for the reasons of being looked at as uh, not only very powerful, not only having huge number of users, um, but also they are so big that they are acting more, they should act more like incumbents in terms of their social responsibility, in terms of their ability to sort of safeguard um, their user base. So, you know, if you think about uh, when the Facebook first came out, it was more about social media for university students. It wasn't that threatening, but I do remember, I think at one point, Yahoo was thinking about acquiring Correct. Facebook. You had an opportunity to buy, actually. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you saw back then and what had happened? Well, I, I, I think um, uh, there, there are a number of waves that came, um, uh, and you had mentioned mobility on your slides. Uh, but, but this idea of social was a, a very important um, trend that has played out in, in, you know, really in front of all of our eyes in terms of how, uh, how, how integrating it can be and also how divisive it can be. And uh, I think social is one of those tools that in, the, uh, in people's hands, mm -hmm. they tend to do everything in a, in a very wide spectrum. They can do everything from bringing people together that are hard to find, and so you see all the early cases of um, people finding community, finding people sharing experiences, you know, people who suffer from very rare diseases from around the world are able to find each other. And, and so the, the, the original goals of social media and the original goals of sharing, um, there's no doubt, has tremendous positives. But over time, you, you can also see how um, uh, it can create uh, uh, echo chambers, which are societies that you only hang out with people that think like you, that may only look like you, only share the same ideas. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the diversity of thought, you don't get the diversity of ideas, um, to where there are uh, obviously things like fake news or deep fakes where people mm -hmm. are using the social media to influence opinion and change people's uh, thinking rightly or wrongly. So the spectrum is very wide, but I think, I think in the beginning, it was viewed as a tool that enabled people to communicate, which was, a, you know, if you think about it, it is a very fundamental mm -hmm. human trait to mm -hmm. want to communicate. It sounds like the, uh, it was a good beginning of a very much democratic open tour, but now you worry about tools that are actually making information that could be distorted in my certain groups of people or non-inclusive 
or creating its own, um, let's say, um, niches that could influence the way the net is being evolved. Yeah, Young, I, I would say the, the fundamental element of trust, who do you trust, has been broken through, um, uh, and, and it's not just Facebook, it's really all the media, mm -hmm. and social media, because you, you don't know if you trust the source mm -hmm. of where the information is coming from. You don't know if, um, if you trust the companies that are handling your privacy. You don't know if you trust that um, your interactions with somebody is true. Um, and so this fundamental fabric of trust mm -hmm. that I think all the communities and societies need is uh, being questioned. Um, and obviously, you know, um, all the big tech companies are, 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 are doing their best, I think, mm -hmm. to their ability uh, to restore that trust. Because I, I, think, I think all these tech companies, and you mentioned platform companies, um, even when I was at Yahoo, I, I, we felt like if we didn't have the trust of our users, if we didn't have trust of our customers, mm -hmm. um, we would have no business. And right. I think this is the challenge now mm -hmm. um, that's facing a lot of the big tech companies. So given, given the, uh, where we are, it's a massive scale, massively connected, massive social media, how do you bring trust back? Is it something that you see government, you know, certain governments, particularly in Europe, trying to bring back the GDPR and others, trying to control, U.S. is looking at it, U.S. is also looking at antitrust. You know, I think sometimes the innovators and the regulators are not always on the same page, right? In fact, typically innovators are way ahead of uh, regulators, and sometimes regulators can also overreact. So if you project 10 years out, where do you think we'll be? Are we going to be even more trusting or are we going to be even bigger mess? Well, I, I think you have to confront the fact that um, there is good reason for regulators to be involved. And, and as governments, uh, when you have the kinds of um, problems that have been created by big tech, whether it's privacy violations, security breaches, you guys you have shown that number of, uh, you know, even your own credit card. Uh, and so it's not just among um, tech companies, it's among financial institutions, it's among car companies. I mean, everybody that has, uh, you know, what, what, what consumers consider trust in the last couple decades are now under attack and under challenge. Um, and, and, and so it's, it, was, it wasn't good enough, uh, it's no longer good enough for um, the government to say, well, maybe the, the industries could figure it out themselves, the self-regulation. So now you have this challenge of very angry consumers, very upset people with, uh, feel like they have been wronged and nowhere to go to. They go to the government and they say, what are you going to do about it? So I, I, I am not surprised and I think um, in many ways uh, the regulators have to do something about um, uh, this, this this, this wave of different challenges that are being posed by technology. Mm -hmm. Yet, the question is, are the regulators backward looking and trying to fix something at mm -hmm. a state of time, mm -hmm. or can they look forward and be able to address the future challenges that come with technology? Mm -hmm. That has always been the challenge between innovators and regulators. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the key things that's evolving in, in the United States and Silicon Valley is a, a more active dialogue between regulators and, um, and, and the innovative community. And, and, and universities play a role, um, you know, kind of uh, research community play a role to help facilitate dialogue. For example, if you look at artificial intelligence, which is now potentially the um, defining technology that could change our society, um, and some would argue it would change our society in a, in a, in a one-way direction. You may, once you go all the way to AI, you may not be able to come back. Um, and it is no longer, I think, enough for innovators to charge ahead and build a technology without having the rest of society thinking through the rules, the implications, and, and, and the ethical uh, implications mm -hmm. that come with it. So this dialogue between smart regulators, forward-thinking regulators, and smart innovators and socially minded innovators, mm -hmm. that dialogue needs to happen, uh, I think, regardless of which technology we're mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. but especially AI. 
So changing subject a little bit to China, because I don't know whether you all know. Didn't, we uh, are, didn't they already talk about China? You know, they, they talked about <laughs> geopolitical side, yes. but we can talk about technology side of it. In fact, I don't know whether you know, Jerry is one of the first investors that enabled Alibaba to be where they are. So you clearly saw the potential of China and you were involved as a board member, still involved as a board member of Alibaba to be the largest e-commerce engine in the world. So talk about do you, how do you see China playing in this going forward basis? Are we going to have a geo-fenced world or are we going to have one integrated world? How do you see that? You know, I, I was at a uh, talk recently and one of, the, one of the speakers reminded all of us that, um, that, that even in the early days of the internet, in the early 2000s for China, um, they, China was, was decoupling from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that Yahoo was not able to build a real business in China, and for that matter, you know, neither did Facebook or Google or, or eBay or mm -hmm. you know, name your uh, uh, big companies, is that I think um, China has always wanted to have its own domestic internet uh, um, market. And so um, it is, uh, it, it may, they, they, they may not have really understood it uh, back in the early 2000s, but I think over the last decade, mm -hmm. it's been clear that um, China has built its own internet rules um, and, uh, uh, and, and has asked any foreign company that is allowed to do business there to comply with their rules. And, um, and so I do think there is this fragmentation around internet. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's not just not in China, really. I think GDPR, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's, a, it's more Western in its, impl in its, in its implementation, uh, is, is, is going to create a lot of um, compliance um, issues for companies that are trying to do global business. Um, and, and, and we're not even going to mention, you know, obviously the, the fragmentation of the Internet uh, along Android and iOS and, and different operating systems. So we have this world where we, we started this conversation young, 30 years ago, I was up, lucky enough to be part of a revolution where you had one standard mm -hmm. in a web, you had one server, you had a browser, you published once and everybody could see it. And today, um, that's not going to be the case. And I think in 10 years, it's going to be more fragmented. Um, yes, their number of users are built in the billions, so obviously you're going to have pockets of people that um, may want certain access to certain kinds of information. Mm -hmm. But if you play this game out where China has its own internet, Europe has its own internet, um, in the US there are privacy legislations at the state level that may result in companies that have to operate in up to 50 different states have 50 different rules. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very complex world where um, uh, the, 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 the clearly the early days are gone. So, um, but, and, and that's okay. I, I think the, the real question is, um, are we really solving the fundamental problem of building trust back with consumers or are we taking swings at problems that may or may not exist by the time we figure out how to, how to implement those, those solutions? So, and so, Jerry, yeah. so what I'm hearing from you is clearly it started as simple, open, connected, the world is going to be much more complex, not only the geopolitical perspective, but just about the, the way technology has proliferated. And gaining the trust of tech is a core of where we need to go. And that requires quite a bit of discussion and debate and collaboration between partners. Well, and I think the partners in the, in the traditional sense is not enough anymore. I think the dialogue between technology companies and innovators and civil society at large needs to happen quickly. Uh, the, the forums like this can encourage that dialogue. Mm -hmm. But um, in my experience, getting the best people around the room, not just the greatest designer of an algorithm, but the best um, per person to think about ethics, the best person to think about inequality and equality, mm -hmm. and the best person to think about jobs and economy. If you can get those people together at the beginning of designing some of these technologies, um, then I think at least you'll be able to elevate and surface mm -hmm. some of the biggest challenges. Well, thank you. I think our time is up. Really appreciate it, Jerry. Thank you. Yep. Got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's great.